Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 124 of the CU Insight Experience. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Q's, the leading talent development solutions provider to the credit union industry. Q's is happy to announce the return of its popular online certification programs from Cornell University. You can get access to Ivy League executive education without leaving your office. Learn more about it at Q's.org slash Cornell. My name is Randy Smith. I'm one of the co-founders of CUinsight.com, and I'm lucky enough to have conversations with the amazing people who make credit unions great, and I get to bring them all to you. I pick their brains and see if we can find a few nuggets that we can all learn from. My guest on today's show is John Hernandez. John is the president and CEO of Kylecom Federal Credit Union, and a few more. This conversation I've been looking forward to having for a long time. When, when I think about John, I think about collaboration and finding new ways to, to do things to make credit unions better. So I knew he was going to have a ton of nuggets for us. We also talked about his credit unions. That There is an S there. Yes, that's plural. And an idea that he came up with to grow one of the credit unions by moving into a complementary niche market. It's a really cool story that's worked out extremely well. I had a, a friend uh, when I told him that John was going to be on the show. He said, we'd really love to hear about was how John finds and grows talent at his credit union. Of course, we had to go there. That's a huge topic out there right now. I think there are things in that that we're all going to be able to take from. He shared some amazing experiences uh, that I think any of us that are leaders in the system will, will gain from and could implement. We wrapped it all up as we always do with some rapid fire questions. I truly enjoyed this conversation. It felt great to actually sit down in person at the reach conference and be able to do that too for the first time in a wow just over 20 months so without further ado i give you my conversation with john hernandez enjoy john welcome to the show good to hey. see you my friend hey randy <laughs> this, glad to be here i have to let everybody know out there this is my first in person besides jill and i doing episodes from our dining room table in over 20 months i think it was Hughes <laughs> symposium two years ago almost that the last time I sat down with someone in person. So it's great to see you. We're at the Reach Conference and, and being able to do this in person makes it even better. For the listeners out there, many people know your name. You've been around a long time and we've all heard the story that you run three credit unions. And we're going to link to that in the show notes so that everybody, if people have been living under a rock and haven't heard it, that, that they know that. But there were so many other directions that I was excited to talk to you about today. Sure. So one, just to get it out there and start, Jill and I had a ride from the airport from Arnold Ramirez. And he, when he heard that you were going to be on the show, he was like, I would love to hear about how you're identifying talent, sometimes younger talent, getting the most out of them. And what was that? I, I actually wrote it down, the word that he, he used, because I thought it was amazing. But like getting your team to perform to their potential, because in this talent market that we're in right now, it's tough to find talent everywhere, right? Thoughts on that? So, well, I guess I had the opportunity that when when I started in in the industry, I was young. You know, I was nineteen years old, and I, it just came natural for me that the challenges that I was going through is what made me thrive to try to do better. And it just made sense for me that when I get an opportunity to meet someone. And I do this quite a bit, by the way, and I don't necessarily suggest it, but people may want to you know, consider it. But I don't hire somebody for a specific position. In fact, I, I just hire them for just that gut feel that this person will be good in my team. Not necessarily that I have a specific position for that person. I do it quite a bit. And with that, you know, I go back to that nature of thinking that, hey, I knew that it was only exciting for me when... I was being challenged. So the difficulty part about maintaining or, or, or retaining good talent, or especially the younger generation, is how do we keep that challenging for them? And while something may have applied well for that matter 10 years ago, yeah. it's not the same today, right? And, and I was just talking to someone last night at dinner, and I was mentioning that because I, I sort of got asked the same question. You know, so and so is so good. You know, how do you even maintain the, you know, et cetera? And, and I said, well, it's not discrimination, but I don't treat them the same. What I mean by that is the approach that I have, even the tone and even the way I sometimes present the information to them is not the same. 
So you're viewing them as individuals that they are, basically. Right. right? Like, I try to just really identify what works for them on how they, they need to be coached. And, and fortunately, last night when we were at the dinner table, one of my former employees was across the table. And I think that's how it all got started. And he kept saying, oh, I remember when John did this to me. And the funny thing is, I had no idea how much that impacted him. Absolutely. That he yeah. said that to the other CEO that we were sitting with. And he said something like, I did so well that year. We put so more loans in the books than we've ever done. And then comes evaluation. John doesn't give me the stars that I was looking for. So I was bummed during the conversation until I gave my piece. This is what he was saying. Yeah. You know, I don't understand. I, I was expecting that you were going to honor what I've done, all the good work, et cetera. And I said to him, well, that was the past. I know this is an evaluation, but this is an evaluation of what you're going to do in the future. While you did that well, let's just throw a number. You did the two million mark. That was great. I was expecting four. And I said, do you want me to grade you at that level or do you want me to grade you at the level that I think you could have done? And he didn't know what to, how to take that at first. And then I think I, after his son came to him, he realized he's just pushing the limits for me, which is good. To see, I mean, you mentioned, and I, I find this extremely intriguing because, you know, I would say one of my strong suits is not managing people. I tend to bounce all over the place. So, <laughs> it's, uh, But I can imagine a lot of people would be thinking about this. Do you take the time in the beginning when people come on board to get to know them? Because like what you're saying is some people are going to react different to right. being challenged in different ways and their motivations are going to be different. Different. So as you build your team, how do you get to know? I wait a little bit uh, to see how they perform just on a natural setting. And then I somehow I can identify the ones that are going to be at a different level or needs to be at a different level. And that's when I spend a little bit more time with them. Uh, that's pretty cool. So not to say that I, you know, I don't welcome them. It's just, it takes a little bit of time for you to be able to identify what the, what they can do. But as far as on a recruitment, that's more of a retention part, right? Right. On a recruitment side, it, it's a lot of gut feel, but you know, there's gotta be some conversation that is initiated to get, you know, to see a little bit of the personality, a little bit of the drive. It's hard to do all of that in, in, in a couple of conversations, but Absolutely. just like anyone else, when you're hiring someone, you try to do your best to try to pick those. And, you know, somehow I'm able to identify that. It's more difficult to be able to retain them and maintain them. I think That's so. uh, I, I thought it was interesting what you said, that idea of like you're you really are you're looking for talent, not necessarily the specific role. Overall, yeah, I mean, know? obviously, I mean, at some point it makes, you know, it, it needs to make sense. Like if I'm right. looking for accounting, then, you know, <laughs> I, I can't just bring a, can't bring in the marketer. <laughs> right. Right. So but ultimately there. I don't know. It just seems to be that there's going to be some type of position that that would make sense for that person. And, and by the way, why I'm pretty confident on being able to do that, yeah. I don't necessarily intend to keep that person at my credit union. When I do it, it's really the intent of you would be good for the credit union industry. Yeah. So yeah. while you may be temporarily with me, I just want to make sure that you know, we get to keep you in our industry somehow. So I've done that before. And like I said, we've had a couple of people that became CEOs from our credit union. A Your couple of people tree, that right? are, you know, <laughs> this one yesterday got an award. So, you know, I'm, I'm pretty proud. I call them the alumni. Yeah, it makes, so, it's got to make right. you feel good. I, I, I get that completely. The way you just talked about the industry there and something that I respect about you, and it kind of leads into another question that I had. And it's this idea, when I think about you, I think about collaboration across, you know, you've, I, I know you're active on the, the league level from the state standpoint. You're active nationally with a lot of the different organizations. What has, I mean, so you talk to a lot of people, what has you most excited in credit unions right now? I don't think it, it ever changed. I mean, it may sound cliche, but it's really that making that difference in people's lives. I mean, I wanted to be a stockbroker. At least I thought I did, you know, when I was a teenager, because I just thought it was a cool thing to do. And, you know, Wall That's Street. That's what I did out of college. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But, yeah. but Somehow I got looped into the credit union. I was working for a bank. I was 18. And this gentleman that walked in every Friday, he walks in and he's casually clothed. And I was the uh, merchant okay. uh, teller. Yeah. And he would come in to me and he would bring me all this cash. Anyway, fast forward, 
he turns out to be the chairman of a credit union. And he said, hey, we're looking for somebody like you at our credit union. I had no idea what a credit union was, right. just yeah. like most of us that uh, did, especially absolutely. at that age. But all I remember is, you know, it was a couple bucks more that I was going to make. And anyway, lo and behold, he was the, the chairman of the credit union. So when I came into the interview, he was a third interview. I went to the HR and I went to the manager. And then the last one was the, the chairman. So... When I walked into that door, I said, well, I guess I'm hired. But it's still that making that difference in people's lives. And, and I really like to make sure that I hear that stories from the team. In fact, most and we're trying to do our best to make most of our marketing about our members. Like I try to eliminate the stock photos yeah. and I just want photos of our members. The real people. And, yeah. and, you know, if they share their experience with us. Lately, we've been doing more mortgage loans and, you know, the photos of the families uh, in front of the homes, that type of thing. It's to me, that matters a lot. Absolutely. And, and again, yeah. you know, so that's what keeps it exciting for me or, or why I want to be and probably more than likely retire from credit unions. Yeah, At least I, that's I the plan. That's, <laughs> that's what we hope. Right. Like, So I want to go back to something you said right there. One of the things, and I'll tell you, this goes back to, you know, I've met like at Q's events before and things like that in the past too. And I remember years ago, I was judging a, a, some awards for Q's. And one of the questions was, who's your biggest competition? And every time it said another credit union, I just wanted to throw away the application, right? You know, I mean, it was, so it's always been a pet right. peeve since then, right? You know, you and I have been to a ton of conferences over the years. I've found that people in our industry are so willing to share. They're so willing to be helpful. But it tends to be like, if I'm in Raleigh and you're in California, we'll tell each other everything. If you're down the street from me, there's less collaboration almost, uh, you know, where it's like that competition <sighs> sometimes. Um, how do you get through that? Well, first of all, that annoys me when I hear it. <laughs> I mean, I guess I feel the same way as you. you, you I would throw an application. If I was. It's just... And I, I facilitate planning sessions for some credit unions. And, and although, luckily enough, I don't hear that a lot there, but every so often you would, right? Maybe not from the management of, of the credit union, but maybe from the board. They think that they're competing with another credit union. Right. I have a simple way of, in my opinion, proving that you're not. What I tell them all the time is pull up 10, 20, 30 credit reports of your members. Look at the credit report. And if the only other financial institution that you see there is that credit union that you think you're competing with, then you win your argument. Yep. But if not, guess what? If it's you're completely yeah. wrong. Yeah. Because that's a great point. I love that. We are not. And again, and I'm, that's data. I'm proving yeah. it to you. And I don't know your members. And I just want you to pull and look at their credit report. And again, if you see other, because I have my own employees saying that to yep. me. Yep. Yep. And that's what I said. All right, let's look at this. Look at that credit report. What else do you see? You see one financial, you see other financial institutions, you see way more than credit unions. I said, so what are you saying that we're competing with this credit union? No, we're not. And by the way, as I told him, if I'm going to lose a member to anybody, I would rather lose them to a credit union than to a bank. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, a bank so, or one of the new players in there. That's the way I prove it. And and that's how I feel about it. I we are that. definitely I'm, not competing. I'm, that's a great one. I'll probably steal that, but I'll give you credit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. Yeah, it's fantastic. I'm a data I, guy, I've had so I love people it. People that yeah. like board members have said, Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. No, right. yeah. Speaking of, I mean, I, I tell this story, but it's kind of like that perception and idea type of a thing. When out of college, I actually was a stockbroker in Michigan. Um, oh, wow. And at the time, everybody had a story of an aunt or somebody who made a bunch of money on Chrysler when it was like bailed out of bankruptcy. Kmart was going through the bankruptcy at the same time and people would want to buy this uh, the stock. And I would tell them because it was just that basic. I'm like, leave the office, drive a mile, go buy Kmart, look at the parking lot, then go buy Walmart or Target. I'm like, it's just cars in a parking lot. You still want to go buy that? Fine. But whatever, you know, I'm, but again, I'm glad I'm out of that industry because I, <laughs> I had no idea how I was going to do that for a whole career. It's, so it's a lot of assumptions rather than actual information absolutely right and so I, I love a story like that let me ask you this it ties right into that competition is coming from everywhere if you were if we were having this conversation a few years back it was the big banks but now it's fintechs it's apple it's uh you know it's amazon it's it, who knows uh, calcom how are you differentiating yourself in the community and the members that you serve to be that primary financial service provider this is probably where the opportunity for me to pivot because you, you said calcom but 
if you don't mind, I'll, I'll talk about Nikkei. Okay. Yeah. So, for sure. uh, only because there, there's something, that, and I'll talk about it. There's a project that we did there. I think it's, it's doing well. So Nikkei, uh, primarily focuses on Japanese American membership in the South Bay area, south of, uh, LAX. And when I came on board 2015 or 14, the first thing I noticed is that their loan to asset ratio is like 20%. 22%. <laughs> so I knew yeah. that, you know, it was only a matter of time. It was an investment club that, you know, we, we would not be able to sustain it. Being a very small credit union, you know, th- it's not going to last, right? So we, we need to figure out a way to increase that loan portfolio. Now, when you do a quick study, easily you'll identify that the Japanese American community are savers. They're generally considered as savers. They're the typical folks that would buy a Toyota Camry, uh, for twenty two thousand dollars, but they would put ten thousand dollars down, yeah, and then they would pay it off in two years. Right, and they all have the eight hundred FICO score, so the yield on those loans are very low. So it makes it very difficult. While you, first of all, you don't already have as many loans on the books, and most of the yields are really low. Yeah. So that makes it really difficult. So it was quick for us to identify that we need to find a complement to that membership. However from our strategy, we have a niche. So we wanted to maintain our niche. Yeah. And since it's a uh, focus on the Japanese American, we wanted to continue the Asian culture. So we said, all right, well, let's do a study well, based on population geographically, which one could we target, right? Yep. And so the, the top five population in addition to Japanese, so the other four are Indian, Filipino, Korean, and Chinese. Okay. Further study shows there's already banks and credit unions for the Korean community and the Chinese, the Chinese community. community yeah. The only two that's left are the Filipino community and the Indian community. And then, again, we're not very smart. We said, well, okay, well, who has the highest population between the two? <laughs> well, it's the Filipino community. Okay. Yeah. And there, there is a Filipino community nearby the, the current corporate office of Nikkei. So uh, Nikkei is in Gardena. And the, the other one that's considered a Filipino community is in Carson, which is, you know, budding cities to each other. The, the Indian community is about maybe 10 miles away. Okay. So either way, they were both our targets, but, you know, one thing at a time. Yep. So that's when Mabuhai Credit Union was, was born. Mabuhai is sort of like aloha in Hawaii. Okay. But it's not used generally just to say hi. It's okay. more when you're celebrating something, like at a wedding, mabuhai, uh, okay. or something yeah, like right. that. It's mabuhai. to live is yeah. what it's related to. But anyway, so we focus on them and we open up a branch under mabuhai. If you look at the logo, they're identical, except we we added a little bit flavor of the Philippine flag just to make it different, but the same. Yeah. Because we wanted to make sure that both Nikkei and the Mabuhai members are going to be able to correlate that, oh, I can go to that branch because that's part of my branch. So it's almost like opening a whole new credit union, but it's all it is is a brand because there's it's no rule that I community. can't do that. Right. Yeah. Right. There's no rule that I can't do that. So I said, why don't I just open up a brand with a completely different name? Yep. And I just put that division thing at the bottom. Yeah. So Anyway, that was open in June 2019. Right. And then COVID hits. Yeah. Well, that. Yep. <laughs> so we had a goal within three years to be able to sustain it. We need to do X amount of loans, X amount of members, and X amount of deposits. We clearly weren't looking for the deposits because, right. again, we already had that from yeah, the, the primary yeah. focus was from the loan side. Well, fast forward, despite pandemic. A year and a half later, we hit that three-year goal. Awesome. All three numbers, the, the total number of membership, the loan portfolio, and the even the deposit side, which we weren't really worried about. That was the third option for us. But from a lending side, we put more loans in the books within that year and a half compared to how much Nikkei had when we first started there in 2015, or very close to, I should say. Very close. Remember, when I first started Nikkei, they only had 22% loan to asset yeah, ratio. Right. But because of adding this, we are now over 40% loan to asset ratio. So this complement of membership type, which you have to operate completely separately and, yeah. and mm-hmm. different, even the, the people, the employees that I have are completely different, really complemented the Nikkei membership. And as a result so far, I think it's the reason why Nikkei is surviving. But more importantly, now 
the the Filipino community who who is considered, I guess, underserved from that matter. They've never had their own financial institution, even though technically they were the second highest population in the Asian community. They've never had their own bank or credit unions. Yeah. Now they do. Now they do. So most of the products are are relatively the same, with the exception of there's a couple things that they do that the uh, Nikkei membership don't do yeah. for the most part. And it's called, one of them is a remittance program. Okay. There's a lot of folks that send money out of the, uh, to, to their home country. Yep. So we introduced that product. And we're very tied into the community, but that's another conversation. I just want to answer that question that what is the difference? So the difference, yeah. the, I guess the short answer to your long question, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, the, no, the no, short no. answer to this. that question yeah. is you've got to find – you know, from a needs base and then, you know, take out the noise around it and just focus on what you have to do. So this is exactly what we said we were going to do. We didn't let, you know, what's the impossible get in the way because everybody was confused. Is this a new credit union? I said, well, I don't know. It's up to you to how you look at it because all I care about is how my members look at it. So, So technically it is, but it isn't. But we knew that making it a division was a lot easier to execute than me starting a, an entire credit union. The whole process of the credit union. I, what I love about that, though, is that, I mean, you talk about getting back to basics, being local, right? Like being in the community. You're not like going into that community and saying, you're almost like this. <laughs> or, or, you know what I'm saying? Like, or like that assumption, like, oh, look, our stock photos look almost like you or something. You know what I mean? Like you're going in and like actually being a part of the community. So I think that's great. There was a question that was popping around my head as you were talking through there. And like, to me, that seems like an outside the box, kind of a big idea. How do you bring around your leadership team to come on board or are they just used to it by this point? <laughs> well, again, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to come into the room and, and dictate everything. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we still follow some of the traditional things of doing things. So we did focus groups. Okay. And I yeah. made sure that we videotape them and we have as many people that could be in the room. The reason strategically we didn't have as many because you want to make sure that it's all about the people that are in the focus group speaking. Yep. So we only had, a, I think, a couple of our teams, but we videotape it so we can show it to the rest of the board and everyone else. So what we did is we did focus group because even though we think we know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I want to hear it directly from the people. So we did three focus groups and all different age category. And to the point where we even want to make sure that we, we invite people that have been to United States or were born in United States or, you know, the different type yep. of Filipino community that Absolutely. are here. And then we also uh, brought in advisory council. And the advisory council, again, we have sort of like a, a, a checklist of who they needed to be. Like a small business owner. When we did a study, there's a lot of uh, Filipino in the healthcare industry. So we need to have someone that's in the healthcare, politicians or, or, or community leader, I should yep, say. Yep. You know, just different areas. And then we ask them to sit on the advisory council and they give us feedback a couple of times a year. Or, I mean, we have a direct connection, but <laughs> we have an official meeting with them twice a year to make sure that whatever initiatives we're thinking of, you know, is in line to what they think we need to do, as well as we, we obviously provide them input on, on that and that's going. And some of the things that came up, like that remittance, that was really pushed through through our advisory council. And our board is awesome because the Nikkei board, they are the ones that are embracing this whole thing, you know, because they understand that their survival now relied on this. So they want to make sure that there's a continuous conversation there. That's pretty cool. So that's, I guess that's how it's not really me telling them I'm letting everybody else tell the entire team what we need to do. So it's really not about me telling them what it is. Getting it's, the buy-in that's your showing and bringing it in just like you are. Yeah, that's yeah. that's fantastic. You mentioned, you know, we talked about it earlier in the conversation, kind of coaching people up and almost your coaching tree that's out there, your alumni network, right? Like one of the things that I've noticed is that we tend to be shaped as leaders by the people that we surround ourselves with. So who does John surround himself with and how have they helped you along the way in, in your career? You know, I've been asked that before. And it's funny, it's that rather than and I guess this just comes naturally with me, maybe because my dad was was in sales. Growing up, he I saw him like deal with different type of people. I can't even say that that he surrounded himself with certain group of people. It was always different. And I actually feel like sometimes when I'm when I'm around people that are I guess not executives, 
I feel like sometimes I learn just a little bit more, yeah. you yeah. know, um, especially because I, I feel like I'm really down to earth, that they are comfortable to talk to me. So it's hard to answer that question. As much as I'd like to tell you that I only surround my people with ABC, <laughs> I, you know, it doesn't really work for me. I mean, I have my my close group of friends and family. Yeah. That, that's different, right? But from a network standpoint, I, I don't set that limitation. I don't put that boundaries. And because I feel like the more you do that, I think you're limiting yourself. I could be completely wrong, right? So maybe I'm going against the grain of what you're saying here, but I just, I don't overthink those things. And yep. I don't overthink a lot of things. Life is too short <laughs> that, you know, I don't take myself very seriously all the time too. But I think as long as, as long as I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm able to help and I'm doing good, that's what it's important to me. And, and, and whoever that person is, it, you know, so I, I can't, I can't tell you exactly what that looks like. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, obviously I like the positive, you know, good vibe people to be around. I mean, that's just natural for us, I, I but I can't tell you that I necessarily um, go into a room and then I would, you know, put my radar. So oh, no, I'm not going to hang out with that person. <laughs> I, I, I don't even mind, you know, sometimes talking to those people that other people didn't want to talk to. Okay. Yeah. Because I think sometimes give you just give that person a little bit of time and opportunity. You'd be surprised that they're they're maybe a lot different than who you think they Absolutely. are. Absolutely, yeah, I know. It's all just that, like that just yeah. because they just don't know how to present themselves, and they may come off a little bit different, and that's why people don't hang with them. I don't know. I just you would probably meet some of the people in this industry, and they would probably tell you that. John came up to me when nobody was talking to me. I That's don't know if that would ever happen, but I can tell you that, that I've, do, I've done that quite a bit. You do that quite a bit. I love that. Is that. A big picture question. Is there something that you think credit unions need to do better to maintain relevance going forward? We, it's a competitive area, place we were. Well, in. if I had that answer, I probably would have given that to all the big leads of, of our industry. But <laughs> I mean, I, I think we're doing it. We're definitely a, a slow... We're not fast followers, I guess is the best way to say it, right? We like others to test the waters before we do it. We're, you know, but I, I do think, you know, being in the industry for almost three decades or more than three decades, I, I feel like we are doing much better at that maybe the last decade than we did the first two. I can guarantee you that, or at least I feel that way. Because even the the conferences that, that we attend, even when you're talking to other credit unions and some of the initiatives that they're doing, I think it's like the forefront. So I think we just need to keep doing that part, right? And more importantly, really get the board more involved, uh -huh. okay. right? Yep. Because they're the stakeholders. They're the ones that's going to help you push it through. And if you don't do that, I think that's a roadblock. And, and having to deal with three board of directors and an advisory board, to me, it's just like going back to your question earlier. How do you get the people to buy into it? Well, it's easier when they can see what you're seeing too, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Although they may have a different perspective, which actually come sometimes a lot better than yours, right? But ultimately, just making sure that we get our board involved. And especially to my small credit union friends, you're right? Right. Put the budget in there for, for the board to attend these conferences. When we do our budget, our training budget, I'm always scared that regulators are are, are going to you know pick on it because it's a lot more than most small credit unions. Okay. But we really do that because I want to make sure that they're out there and learning as much as they could. Because you're proposing things to them and they're making decisions on behalf of your membership. Yeah, yeah. And you're only giving them that time presenting the information that you have. It's as concise, as summarized, as cliff notes as it gets. <laughs> yeah. And then you expect them to make this decision. Right. I, that's almost not fair. Right. So the way I look at it, the more they are exposed, the better the credit union will be. And that relationship with your board, I, I tell the, some of the new CEOs, you know, when they when they say any tips coming from, you know, an <laughs> right. old timer, yeah, somebody who's been around. And I, yeah. I said, well, you know, I don't know what you want to call it, but, you know, that relationship with the board is important. And it's not about kiss and ass. Can I say that? Yep. Sorry. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about that. Yeah. It, it's about making them understand, number one, what's the movement about? Yeah. And number two, and probably more importantly, how is it really going to benefit 
the people that you're representing as a board, the membership, the community, right? Yeah. And I think I think our industry does a pretty good job educating, especially now. Like I said, compared to the first two decades that I've been part of, yep. the last decades we've we've been doing much better, and I and I can't wait from my last decade before maybe I retire. But, you know, I, I think if we just keep doing that, we'll be much better. Maybe before I retire, we'll hit that 10% market share or beyond. So I want to talk a little bit about the, that leadership journey of yours here while we, while we have a little bit of time. But like, what was the inspiration? Did it, it was being a CEO something you always wanted to do? Like as you were coming up and you mentioned starting in the card, you're 19 years old. I mean, were you like, someday I want that office? <laughs> you know? Like, <laughs> No, it, that didn't come right away, but the opportunity came right away. Okay. So, <laughs> I mean, I was 19, I was a teller. Yeah. And six years later. Oh, that's amazing. Um, yeah. An examiner actually asked my CEO at the time and said, hey, do you know anybody that could fill a position at a small credit? And, and it was micro. Yeah. It's $3 million. Okay. okay. Right? Yep. So then I think... The examiner asked the, the, our, my CEO and said, what do you think of John? Would you, do you think he would, you know, he would be able to manage a, a small credit? <laughs> and, and I think my CEO's response to him was, well, he's already trying to tell me what to do. So, so maybe fine. it's time for yeah. him to go. <laughs> That's funny. Wow. So, so, you know, I had a quick conversation with him and I said, all right, well, I don't exactly know everything that I need to do as a CEO, but it's a $3 million credit. You know, it's probably the best thing for me to learn. Yeah. And so I asked him, I said, you know, you're going to be available for calls if I need to, right? And he said, <laughs> absolutely. So fast forward, when I got there, you know, I had to figure out what that role was. Right. Absolutely. And yeah. lo and behold, the, the former CEO was terminated because of not performance. And there was just so many challenges. They didn't even have benefits for the employee. Well, there were only two of us. But, right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the perfect place for me to actually, I think, learn as much as possible. And three years later, when I finally came out and I said to myself, OK, I've got to go out there and try to, you know, pick some people's brain. I, you know, right. ego aside, I, I've always said, hey, I'm not the smartest person. There's a lot of smart people out there. Absolutely. And if yeah. I could learn from them, it might fast forward the process, right? So finally, after three years, when I finally feel like, okay, I've gotten to the point where I learned what I need to learn. Now I need to go out. And that's when I start searching. Okay, what's out there? Yeah. That's when I learned about WCMS. <laughs> okay. Yep. And then after WCMS is Qs, I yeah. learned about the league, the chapters. And I just, I said, all right, I'll, I'll go out there. And, and that was a tremendous help in my growth. And it probably catapulted to really knowing or more knowing what your job is as a CEO and not just to be at that credit union, at that small credit union. And I just want to share this with you. So the first conference that I attended, I walked into this group and there were a bunch of small credit union CEO uh, folks. And I was introducing myself, never been to anywhere, right? right? Yeah. I said, hi, I'm, I'm John Hernandez. I'm, I'm with, you know, that Calcom credit union. At the time it was a different name, but and this lady, this is the first interaction. This lady didn't a shake my hands right away. And she goes, oh, we know you. We were just waiting to see how long you were going to last, but we're so glad you're here. And she gives me a hug. And that was my reception to the yeah, credit union conference. And I said to myself, these people are yeah, great. Yeah, these are fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> but it was just hug. funny that yeah. she did say we were just thinking how long you were going to last because, again, you know, it was, I was put in a tough position, but I, you and know, at a young age, too, it's the so. best way to learn. I uh, think, so. Throw to the fire. That's, that's pretty cool. So my question I always ask on the show, is there something your team has heard you say so many times they can finish your sentence? A uh, <laughs> couple things. So, you know, I've always said it's, it's not who, you know, it's who knows you. So despite what our efforts are in our marketing as best as marketing of a small credit union, yep. Uh, we're actually doing more data now and trying to study our members. I, I keep reminding the team that, remember, guys, it's, it's not who we know. It's our members knowing us. They it's it's know. who yep. knows us, yep. right? Yep. And that, that works even personalized yeah, and, and everything, right? Because yeah. you make your assumption just because you know that person, that person knows you. Know right. that you can't. Yep. And, and again, you know, I'm not a marketing person, but to me, I think that makes sense. Uh, until they even know who you are. 
your effort hasn't really gone enough. So um, I, I had an early sales manager who was like, that field of dreams, if you build it, they will come is absolute bullshit, <laughs> right? Because he's like, you got to tell people about it first, right? Like if they if you don't tell people, they're not coming. So <laughs> and, and I, I don't know if, if that's one that they can easily remember because I have my little my few mantras, I guess. The other one is my screen door policy. Uh, have you ever heard of this? Okay. No. So my screen door policy is, all right, bring me the problem, yep. but don't forget the solution that you've come up with. Because most of the time, you know it more than I do. I, I'm just helping you, you know, think it through. So that's my screen door policy. I don't have an open door policy. There's a screen door. That screen is like, bring the solution. And you know, the funny thing is probably three-fourths or two-thirds of the time, the solution that they bring to you is the is correct the, solution. Yep. <laughs> the approach may need to be finesse or change or uh, adjusted. But other than that, it's already what they're thinking, right? So, I, I mean, to me, they know that. My entire management team knows that. I, I think that's amazing. That was a tough thing for me to learn, like building CU Insight as we grew, was like if somebody had come to me with a problem, I would almost always have the answer i thought um but it, you know <laughs> yeah. to, but to stop and it's something over the years i've been much more intentional about is that idea of going well what would you do before i ever give my opinion because like you said majority of the time they're the ones working on it they already have an idea of what to do and it's probably the right one <laughs> so and it might be a better one than i would have ever thought at least i found yeah, that now in so. a lot of cases uh, you know what's very humbling for me and i'm probably should not talk about it because i'm embarrassed <laughs> but so we started a a social media task force two, three years ago, maybe three years ago, yeah. post-pandemic or, or pre-pandemic. And we needed to do that because I myself didn't know enough. And I have a lot of young employees. I'm the oldest one in the team. Yep. So yep. Um, <laughs> I have a lot of young young employees. So I said, you know, we, we need to build this. It's It was so humbling. We go into that meeting. It felt like I was, I was stalling the progress of the meeting <laughs> because right. I was asking questions that should have been like, they, I get the look like, what do you mean you didn't know that kind of a look without <laughs> saying what? it? But And they're they're giving the looks at each other. And they were probably texting it like, I can't believe you know, he, he doesn't, doesn't even know this. that, yeah, right? right? No, no yeah. literally. And there were so many things that – and it was good. It was good for me to learn it. But I think more importantly, I think it was good for them to see that I was willing to learn that from them. From them, yep. And You're then right. we actually implemented some of the initiatives that, that they shared with us or, or some of the ideas that they shared. And we've had some success, at least for us. I mean, now we're about to do another task force. And I'm, I'm looking forward to another learning, but I'm going to do a little bit more homework before I go to the it's meeting. So <laughs> I don't stall the process. Cause I felt like the first two meetings, it was just like, why don't we just educate John before we move on to the next thing? <laughs> You're like, what is this TikTok and machine out there? I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> the TikTok. <laughs> the TikTok, right from yesterday. The, the guy at the cup. I, I cracked me up because I'm the oldest person at our company as well. So I, I joked for years when I was like, did you put it on the Twitter machine? <laughs> so I, even though I knew what it was, I just always thought of like, if I'm going to be the old guy here, let, let's uh, so. Wouldn't be the CU Insight experience without, you know, asking some rapid fire questions. The, the questions are rapid. Your answers don't have to be. But I do want to be respectful of your time and get out here at this conference and see people in real life. So first question, is there something over your career that you remember saying no to? Maybe that opportunity that you're sure glad you did because life might have looked different. I'm sure I've had, I mean, nothing that's like life changing per se, but I'm sure I've had some opportunities that came not necessarily from a, from a job wise, but maybe to sit on something like a committee yeah. and... I think just 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 like anyone else though, but if they don't think that they can put in the time, you know, why be part of it, right? Or if you don't think that you completely are all into what what they're trying to accomplish, why be part of it? There's probably somebody better. Than, um, than now, unless you want to go in there intentionally so that you can maybe change the mindset, I would love to do that. But if it's just you know same of same, yeah, there's there's no point. So. I can't say that there's anything like significantly a big thing that I said no to. I mean, unless you're going back high school and I said no to drugs and I still said no to drugs. But, you know, I mean, whiskey, on the other hand, is different. Okay, you can edit that part. Right, no, no, I, most people that know me know whiskey yeah, so, is, is yeah. my thing. So. <laughs> I'm going to skip a question, but come back to the one. Uh, but you just said high school. What was John like in high school? Did you get in any memorable trouble? Yet you're, you're CEO of the California League. No one's been able to beat her grand theft auto on 
the show. So well, yeah, there you go. No, I didn't. I didn't steal a car. At least I didn't think I was stealing the car. It was my friend's dad's car. We stole, but uh, yeah. But it was my own brother. Actually, I I didn't have my license yet. But I'm sure. I, I hope I'm not the only one that have said this. But no, I, sure. my own brother, my oldest brother, had his car. I didn't have my driver's license yet. I was. I already knew how to drive. I was already um, driving. And yes, I, I took his car without letting him know, and he called the police and <laughs> didn't realize that I was the one. That took <laughs> you were the one who had it. So I got pulled over by the police, uh, and yeah. that didn't go really well at the beginning because it looked really bad that I was Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> but it was my brother's like, car. Oh, so it's your brother. Yeah. High school, uh, long hair. I was an athlete. I first I started wrestling, but when the girl was beating me, I thought it was time to quit <laughs> and then I, I i went into um water polo okay because football uh, i guess i wasn't big enough but interestingly i actually played basketball did you really yeah there were probably 50 uh kids that tried out and i made the team because i can dribble and yeah the only thing is uh the coach always tells me that when he puts me in he goes just just put the ball in play right let's yeah. not try to shoot okay <laughs> <laughs> so I can dribble awesome. the ball, but I guess I can't shoot. You weren't allowed Needless to, shoot. to say, I yeah. wasn't a shooting guard. I was a point guard. You were the point guard. You were moving the, the, the ball around. That's for sure. What are you reading? And is, is there one of those books that you just think everybody should read or that you've gifted over the years? Well, uh, this gets a little personal right now, but unfortunately, I have a family member that is um, suffering with bipolar. Oh, okay. we, just, we just found out. So yeah. that's really a book that I'm... That's you know, what you're starting to read because I, I think yourself. it's essential for me to try to understand what's going on there. Absolutely. Um, what do I like to read? I, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I'm not much of a reader. You could probably tell because I'm not as eloquent as, as most people, but I do like those inspirational books and uh, as well as the obvious business kind of books, but yeah. I don't read as much, probably a book a year. Okay. Yeah. So... Yeah. Yeah. We all get our, there's so much information out there, right? So the random question, what's the best album of all time? <laughs> so this is going to date me, although I already did. I said three decades in the industry. I'm an 80s guy. Yeah. I like uh, Tears for Fears. Okay. Depeche Mode. Oh, Echo right. and the Bunny Man. <laughs> so the you had, Cure. You, you were, if I have to pick you, a you had the, album, right? You had the hair and <laughs> was it, were you a little dark at that time? <laughs> yes, I was. Um, if I had to pick an album, it, I would probably say, because this album had like all, almost every song I like. Yep. That's the, that's it, what? Yeah. I believe it's called The Hurting. And it's Tears for Fears. Uh, Tears for Fears. So, awesome. Yeah, I love that all those a, music. That is three years in. That is a first for uh, And it was for, awesome for that right one. now. And I absolutely love that. So. And what's awesome right now is when you look, when you see movies, the background music are a lot of 80s. Because I think the, whatever you call it, the music producers yeah. are all probably my age that so they're putting that on there. So that's all like, the yeah, that's oh, love it. It, <laughs> it cracks me up, the songs that are being put in that. And even uh, Joel Sun's 10, like in the background of video games, it's like songs that I grew up with and stuff. So it's it's, right. it's, it's awesome. <laughs> Uh, there's a question I didn't send you in advance. When you hear the word success, who is the first person that comes to mind and why? I think it's my dad, although, you know, he's passed now. And, and let me just expand on that. Yeah. So, you know, his his idea of success wasn't about all about money. It was all about his kids. So That's I'm awesome. one of five. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I've got three brothers and a sister. And my sister is in the middle of the four boys. Okay. And I'm number four. All right. And to him, you know, it was it was our success was his success. And he's always told us. And the funny thing is when every time we go up to him and bring him a problem, the first thing he does is laugh at it. <laughs> okay. Not like laughing, <laughs> yeah, laughing, right. but he kind of like chuckles. Yeah. He's almost enjoying it. And then he ends it with this. And that's why I can never forget it. You know, success is tough, but maintaining the success is even harder okay he said Word right now the reason why i'm <laughs> chuckling is because he's saying you know why, why i'm laughing is because you're just getting started and you're enjoying every moment of it right yeah. because you all of a sudden made it to the top of the mountain right but it's not that it's it's trying to you know stay on top yeah right and then he does the triangle thing in his hand and he says, you know, the triangle thing, as you get to the top, what happens? You know, it gets lonelier up there. Yeah, yeah. It gets a little tougher to be able to surround yourself with the right, right people. That's probably the reason why I don't have that. And yeah. I don't like and that. You don't, because, you're not trying to find it. Yeah, yeah. Right. So 
I love that. It's always, I've always looked up to him because of the fact that even in his later days when he was sick already, you know, when, I, when we were little, he was a sales for Toyota. Okay. And he was VP of sales for, for Asia. And then when, when we came to the United States, because by the way, I'm, I wasn't born here. I was right. 14 when I came. Okay. Uh, toughest time. You're a teenager. But anyway, right, so when he, say, 14, that's a tough age. Right. Too, so. So we, and so when he came here, it was about balancing life. Like, you know, he was all about life balance even before life balance yeah. was there. Anyway, to fast forward, he only worked from the first to the 15th. Literally, oh, okay. As yeah. a sales guy, and yeah. then his boss would always tell him, "Carl, if you would just you know work a little bit more, you would be the top sales." And he said, "What am I now?" And the the boss says, two, sometimes three." Yeah. And he said, "You should just be lucky that I'm still working the fifteen days. Right. I'm not trying to be number one. I'm just trying to do what I need to." And then the rest of them, I spend time with my family. For the family. That's to a, me, that's that, awesome. is, that, yeah. is a, that is that is a success. I love it. You know, when people ask me, why three credit unions? And yeah. I say, why not? Yeah. Just not overthink about it. Let's just make it happen. Let's just do it. Well, John, I, I appreciate you taking the time today to be on the show. I have one last question for you. Any any thoughts or asks for the listeners out there? Uh, I'm sure they're uh, going to love to hear more. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Uh, what to leave them off? I guess ask the question. Yeah, well, let's give everybody an opportunity, right? Large, small, credit unions, whatever that might be. I think let's just try to help each other out and, and keep moving on with what we're doing for our members. Uh, that is the perfect way to wrap up. If people have more questions of you, what's your poison? Email, Twitter, LinkedIn? Uh, Email probably best. Uh, J Hernandez at calcomcu.org. And you'll probably put that uh, we'll on We'll link to that in the bio as well. And we'll link to the articles uh, where you've been featured before so people can hear all about that. But I, I appreciate it again. Enjoy the rest of the conference. I hope you have a great day and be well, my friend. Mabuhai. Before we go, I would like to first and foremost thank all of you for being you and listening today. And once again, thank you to John for taking the time out of uh, his, it was a, it's a busy time for him here at the Reach Conference. So taking t- that time away to, to share his lessons that he's learned over his career with all of us. And a big thank you to our sponsors, Q's, our sponsor Q's, no, there's just one of them. Uh, don't, don't forget their popular online certification programs from Cornell University are back where you can get Ivy League executive education without leaving your office. Once again, you can find out more information information at cues.org slash Cornell. Uh, a couple more things before we go. Subscribe to the CU Insight Experience podcast on your favorite podcast player, Apple, Google, Amazon, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. If you're, if you're on the Apple machine, make sure to give us five stars if you think we deserve it as well. And a review is always great and helps with the visibility. And, and then lastly, check out the CU Insight Experience podcast book list to find your, your next great read from the, the suggestions of the guests that have been on our show. Thank you all again for listening. I hope you have a great day and please be well, friends. Friends. 